we're just about to 420. We got a pretty good crowd in here. Uh, late afternoon, but I'm going to hopefully hold your attention because I'm up here giving you a sales pitch on something I'm very excited about, which is GraphQL. So GraphQL is an interesting alternative to the way that many people have been doing APIs throughout the years. And what makes it interesting is rethinking who has power in this situation. For the longest time, we have said the server has the power. But GraphQL says, what if the client had a lot more declarative power? What if we had a really clear spec that could outline this? So let me begin by getting to know the room. How many of you in here would say that you build REST APIs? There we go. And yet you still showed up with my link bait title here. So you're in here still smiling for the most part. That's good to see, willing to try this out. So that was the majority of the room, I would say. Uh, how many of you are doing more RPC style, standing for remote procedure call style APIs? Nobody claims RPC. Wow, usually you get a few hands there. I'd be interested to see some of you that are saying you're doing REST, maybe doing something that's a little more RPC. Be interesting to see. Who's doing SOAP? There we go. That was a random image generator. I had no idea what would pop up there. That, strange coincidence, but yeah. I, I've done SOAP. I, I, it wasn't my favorite thing, uh, but it did have its uh, time for sure. And it's also interesting because GraphQL, much like SOAP, SOAP has a big complicated specification. Well, GraphQL has a spec too, and that's one of the things I'm going to fixate on is the beauty of having a spec, that that really is a good thing. Who in here, who, who am I preaching to the choir already doing GraphQL? Nobody. Okay, good. So if I say something wrong, nobody can call me on it. All right. We'll move on there. So what we're going to do uh, to begin, I want to give you a feel for GraphQL. Now, one way I could do that is I could go out to GitHub site. Uh, and you can feel free to do so on your own. I'm actually going to just run something local because it's a little more approachable. But a great way to get a feel for the power of GraphQL is, not surprisingly, to use the darn thing. So I have started up over on my local machine an instance of a GraphQL server. And we'll get into how the thing actually works in a moment. But what I want to show you to begin is me interacting with a GraphQL endpoint. And I'm going to do that using a tool called Graphical. It's a pretty kitschy name. I like it. Graphical is a UI that comes out of the box when you have a GraphQL server. To have this documentation experience that I'm about to show you, I set a Boolean to say, yes, please. So I want to emphasize that the goodness I'm about to show you is free of charge, which is a revelation if you're somebody that has worked in other API technologies where the documentation story is, well, I don't know, maybe we should go check out Swagger, or maybe we should roll our own, these sorts of things. No, this is because of the spec just generated. So what we have is docs over here on the left-hand side. When I pull this up, you can see I have this docs tab. So I can start to click through and see what types of data we're working with here. So my GraphQL API deals with posts, deals with users, and deals with comments. So you can see this is really related to a blog. So I can come over here, and I can decide that I want to make a query. Now notice, the moment I typed Q, I have autocomplete support here within Graphical. So I'm going to hit Tab and start my query. My query is going to look a little bit like JavaScript, uh, but this is uh, GraphQL's query language. So right here, I can begin to write my query. I'm hitting control space to get autocomplete support along the way here. So you can see already, these are the things that I can query for. Maybe I want to look for a single post, or maybe I want to look for all the posts. So just give me all the posts right here. And I want the ID for the post, and I want the title for the post. I'm going to come up here and hit play. And look at that. I got my data. What if I want a little bit more data? Uh, I'd also like the views, the number of views for this post. Here's what I'm getting on the right. Do you already see the goodness going on here? I am on the client. I could make a call and say, this is precisely the JSON that I want, and that's what I get. 
This is a revelation because how many of you in here right now have an API that allows the client to say, I want these particular properties on this exact object? Who in the room can do that? No hands go up. And that is interesting because if you think about, if I came to you and I said, hey, the requirements are when somebody requests a user, they need to be able to request specific properties. You can probably imagine in your head, well, I could make that happen, but I need to come up with a way to do so. That means I've got to support maybe some kind of a query string where somebody says fields, and then they could put in a comma delimited list of fields that they might want, properties that they want on that object. So you'd more or less uh, come up with your own way to solve it as a programmer. So I think all of us in here understand that what I'm doing just right here isn't technically a huge hurdle. I believe that the reason that this room isn't doing what I just showed you is because there's no spec that's telling you that you should. And in fact, what I'm getting right here is free. Because I'm using GraphQL, I get to tell the server what data I want. Now, the plot gets nicer too because I can end up requesting nested data. I could come in here and also say that I would like the comments associated with the posts that I get back. And when you give me those comments, I'd like the body for the comment, and I'd like the date that that comment was entered. Now check that out. Now I have just gotten relational data. I chained from the post over to the comment. Life is good. Like when I saw this, this is what got me really excited about GraphQL because I thought, I have seen in my career about two APIs that let me do this, that let me say, I want to go from here to here to chain relationships. And again, when you think about it, you could write the code to do this. You, if you went back to your desk, you could make it happen. But the way that you do it and the way that you do it would be different. And that's not necessarily wrong, but every time that developers are out there solving a problem ad hoc, we're sort of reinventing the wheel. And the question is, why? What I'm showing you is this idea of a client requesting data from the server in a specific format is a solved problem now with GraphQL because the specification gives it to you for free. So if you choose to use a GraphQL server and describe your data using a GraphQL schema, then this experience becomes your reality. So how many of you in here have an API that allows you to chain through relationships of entities in a single query? One hand, but it was only like halfway up. I don't know if that was. Oh, okay. So it's it's more uh, it's almost a custom endpoint than you'd say so, sort of an app specific API, which those are very common and those are useful. And in fact, there's some real benefits to that too because you can tweak that exact call to be perfect for that particular use case too. So we have now requested uh, some some data along here. Now GraphQL isn't just about queries though. Uh, I also have the opportunity to change data. Uh, so I could come into here and write a mutation. Uh, oh, before I do, I wanted to show one other thing. I can also declare, uh, oops, there we go. I can also declare names that are custom for properties. Have you ever had this before where somebody publishes an API but you don't like the properties that have been sent back on those objects? You'd like to be able to tweak some of the names in the JSON. Well now, instead of me having to iterate over some array of 100 values and change a few properties in that array in a loop over in JavaScript on the client, I tell the server, when you give me the title from the database, which is a type of string, I can see that from the metadata, I want you to name that value as my title instead of title. So notice that now the JSON that I get back, again, honors my request. 
So see how all of a sudden a lot of power has shifted from the developer who wrote the API over to the UI developer who is saying, I need some JSON and I need it to look this way and it'd be really nice if I could make one HTTP call instead of 17 because I gotta go chain from here to here to here to here and manipulate all this data to get it into a shape I want. So a reality for somebody who's working with GraphQL is, chances are you can make one call to get the data that you need and to get it in the shape that you desire, which is super luxurious. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning uh, because I mentioned that this story isn't just about queries, it's also about mutations. So when I say mutation, I mean changing data. Now again, notice how, it, oh, is my font size big enough? Back row? Okay, good. Uh, notice how I clicked over here and now I can see, again, the different ways that I can manipulate data in this uh, particular API. I can create a post, update a post, I can create comments, uh, remove comments, those sorts of things. So let's say that I want to create a post. Well, I come over here and I write mutation. And then uh, for my mutation, I want to call, notice how again, I get autocomplete support. So I can see, this is a discoverable API. I can see the things that I can do to mutate data. And notice that it is only showing me mutations now since it knows that I'm declaring a mutation. So I would like to create a post. And notice this as well. I know what I need to pass to it and it is prompting me. I need to pass an ID. And yes, I admit this example, it's weird that I'm passing an ID. I'm, I'm on the client telling the server what ID. That's not normally the way you would structure GraphQL, but just deal with the oddity here. It made my demo a little bit simpler. Uh, I'm using a tool that lets me take some chunk of JSON and then stand up a GraphQL server. It is mind blowing how simple this thing is. So I'll show you how this works next, but let's first get our first mutation to go here. So we're gonna set the title to uh, I love GraphQL and we're gonna set the views to, oh, let me move this over some. I'm gonna close out this as well so we can see it. Set the views to 100 and what am I forgetting here? User ID will set to, oh, uh, let's see, 254 I think is a relevant or a valid user ID. Now here's, pay attention, because here's where things get interesting again. So you look at this and you go, well man, that almost, it looks a lot like a function call, except I'm naming each one of the arguments in the function call. But here's where it's gonna do something else that I bet none of your APIs do right now. I can say, after you write this, give me back certain properties on that object. Give me back the ID or give me back the title. So I can declare what I want in the response when I'm making a mutation. Anybody have an API that does that right now? No hands again. And again, if I said you need to do this, I believe that anybody in this room is a programmer, you'd go, yeah, I can code it, I can make it happen, but none of us would do it the same way. So having a specification, it's not just about the fact that it, this is technically really hard to do, it's about the fact that you literally don't have to do anything. Good stuff that you're likely to enjoy is just there in the box. So that's part of what gets me excited about GraphQL. So I'm going to hit the play button here. And when I do, notice that I got a response and the response contains precisely what I asked for. Now that I did this, if I come back over, let's see whether my data comes through here. I've got my query. I this time want to see all posts. And for all the posts, I just want to see the title. That'll be good enough. And there it is. Uh, oh, I guess I have two in here. I already had one in there that was called uh, I, Why I Love GraphQL, but this was my new one right here. And in fact, we could prove that if I also bring back the ID. There we go. And as a side note, you don't have to put the query in here in your query because it is inferred. It's basically the default. So if I leave query out, then, oh, it's unhappy because I am missing a curly brace. But there we go. Oh, and in fact, uh, I believe I can do, 
Oh, no, I can't. I need those on the outside. There we go. So query is inferred as the default. So we have now done multiple things that nobody's APIs today are doing, which is pretty striking. How many of you believe that this would be useful? OK. So you feel like I did. When I saw this, I was so giddy. I mean, I'm basically here speaking on this because I just want more people to use it. So hopefully my next dev job, I'm working with GraphQL. It increase the chances. Because as a front-end developer, I'm a front-end developer. I work in React a lot. Uh, so politically, I often don't have enough power to force people to change their API structures. But I'm convinced that if more of us move to this structure, we're going to have better APIs that are more flexible for people. Let me back up and tell you why GraphQL exists at all. Facebook. Facebook created GraphQL. They created it to scratch their own itch, not surprisingly. So Facebook has one of the highest trafficked websites in the world, and what do you know, also one of the he most heavily used mobile sites in the world. And what they had was API for the website, API for the mobile site. And they said, OK, why are we maintaining two APIs? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just have one API that worked for both? And you can imagine why they had two separate ones, because the mobile app, they said, we only need a little bit of the data because we're only doing some of the features. And the web, we need lots of data because we've got all the features. Well, what you recognize is they designed GraphQL deliberately to say, you know what? We could build one API if we can come up with a way for the client to say what it wants. So you think about the level of flexibility here. If I stand up an API in GraphQL, somebody go build the UI. Since the UI is now declaring what it wants, it's no longer a situation where you go in, oh, OK, we've got to go do API work to support this user interface. No, if, as long as GraphQL is exposing the data, you're done. Because you merely need to convey to GraphQL what your requirements are. OK, so I told you that my demo was wildly simple, and it is. So my first demo, what I want to show you is the code involved here. So I am working in Node. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Node? Probably lots of hands. OK. Uh, and as JavaScript developers, we work with Node a lot. Uh, what I'm using is a tool called JSON GraphQL Server. This package is crazy, crazy useful, uh, very, very simple. And in fact, as a side note, uh, has anybody used JSON Server? OK, not enough hands there. So even if you decide GraphQL isn't for you today, go check out JSON Server. It's the free, uh, well, I say free, it's free, it's open source, uh, but it is the same thing as what I'm showing you here, but for traditional RESTful APIs. Uh, again, I say RESTful here because RESTful doesn't really mean anything to everybody consistently. We all disagree on exactly what a RESTful API is. I won't keep doing this because at some point my arms will get tired, but yeah. So let me show how this actually works. This is it. I put some JSON in a file, it parsed that JSON and gave me everything that you just saw. Does that blow your mind? When I tried this, because it says on their docs, they're going, go ahead, stand up a GraphQL server in 30 seconds. I thought, well, that's a bold statement. And I had it stood up in about 45 seconds because Wi-Fi was slow. Uh, it, it really is well done. Now, of course, there's a massive amount of magic going on here. Uh, so let's look at something that's uh, potentially a little more interesting. Uh, or I should say, a little more realistic. Let me come over and switch. We're going to go over to Express GraphQL. So here I'm going to show you a GraphQL server configured to run via Express. So it's going to start right up. This one's running on localhost 5000. So this looks just the same, it's open graphical. Now given this is serving different data, this has some blog data, has some posts in it, and then we can see the different pieces of data that it has here. Uh, excuse me, but again, I can come over here and uh, query whatever I like, although this is a relationship with an author here, so I would need to pull in maybe the author's name, something like that, and now I have gotten some more here. So how does this actually work? Again, surprisingly little code, 20 lines of code. 
OK, that's not fair. It's not the only file. But still, OK, so Express, assuming you're familiar with Express, I am instantiating Express, and I'm pulling in this package called Express GraphQL, which connects a GraphQL server with Express. To make that connection, I, much like other Express middleware, I call app.use, and I tell it, hey, here's the schema for my API. We're going to look at the schema in a second. I want you to pretty print the JSON, and here's the one that really makes me smile. That graphical tool that we're looking at, it's a Boolean. Do, would you like docs? Yes, please. Done. That, I love that piece. So I say app.listen, and it starts it. So let's go look at the schema, because the schema will give you a sense for how this is put together. Uh, and here we go. OK, I'm going to collapse the side of this. GraphQL schemas are strongly typed. And that's why we were over there able to see that this field's an integer, this field is a string, and so on. So we come in here and we say, OK, I've got this author, and that author is a GraphQL object. Here are the fields on that object, and here's the name that I want you to display. Same story with a post. A post has an ID, has a field, and notice here, this is a post that has an author, and that author ends up having its own uh, content here, its own type. So we can go look at the author, which is declared right down here below, that an author has these fields. So I'm imagining, how many of you are C Sharp or Java devs? Probably lots of hands. There we go. So you're familiar with types already. Uh, so you think about this, this is not much different than declaring a class, but you're following a unique structure here for GraphQL to declare these types. And once you do this, you are following a specification. So since we're following a spec, this experience that we just saw right here happens. This is the beauty of having a spec rather than having uh, the responsibility for building from scratch. Now, the magic for all of this uh, comes down to resolvers, uh, resolvers within your schema. So what I want to point out here is, look right here. See this resolve property? This is where I tell GraphQL how to get the data. So in this case, I'm saying look in data and call get author. Well, if I show you data in this case is hard-coded data over here in a file. I did that for simplicity. But imagine instead that I'm making a query to a database. Or imagine that I'm making a call to your API today. That's really what I'm suggesting here. A bunch of us in here, I asked at the beginning, how many of you, raise your hands, uh, have RESTful APIs or SOAP APIs, and not surprisingly, everybody raises their hand for one of those two or three options. The beauty of GraphQL is you leverage all of that stuff that you've done right now, and you can end up calling them from GraphQL. You can end up putting this experience in front of your existing APIs. And by doing so, you suddenly get the ability to say, OK, I just want some of the data instead of all of the data. Or I want these relationships along the way. And the way that that happens is through your resolvers. So these resolvers, in this case, are calling hard-coded data, but they could go ahead and call an API. So let me show you what I mean by this. Let's look at something a little more realistic again. I'm slowly getting more realistic. Uh, now we're going to go over to uh, React. Here we go. We're going to go to Wrap REST API. As a side note, all the demos I'm showing are up on my GitHub repo. If you go to github.com slash Coreyhouse, all one word, then you can also fiddle with all of this. OK, so let's go over to Wrap REST API. So what I'm going to do is show you an existing API that is getting served up by putting GraphQL in front of it. What I'm going to do is start it up again. What this is going to do is start up two different APIs on my machine. Let me expand this so you can see what's going on. 
So it started up a local API at localhost 3000 using JSON server. I was just singing JSON server's praises a little bit earlier. I use JSON server all the time because as a side note, again, as somebody that works in, in React a lot, I don't want to hit the real APIs. I want to hit mock APIs because mock APIs are instant. I don't want to have any kind of delay. Also, mock APIs don't go down. Mock APIs are on my local machine. As long as I can boot my machine, I can run that API. So I can code while I'm on an airplane without paying the eight bucks to Southwest. So that's nice. So let, let me show you, this is, uh, if, again, if you're not familiar with JSON server, I can do the same thing that I did with that GraphQL setup earlier where I declare some JSON and it stands up a RESTful API for me. So I have a blog posts API right here. I can click on it and you can see here's a bunch of blog posts. I have some authors and I have some companies. And the amount of configuration that I did to get this RESTful API was as simple as me creating a file uh, over, over here to generate the database. Uh, oh, this looks a little more involved. This isn't uh, actually, uh, this could be far simpler, but uh, I won't get into why it's not here. Nonetheless, you can do it simply with a file though. So what we have here is a RESTful API. So picture at the moment that I'm showing you your existing API, traditional RESTful API. Notice that when I go to slash blog posts, it gives me blog posts. I could also do a post to write new blog posts. I could do a delete verb to delete blog posts. All of that is supported through uh, JSON server. But what we want to do is wrap this API with GraphQL so that we can enjoy all the goodness that I showed you guys at the beginning. So to hit the GraphQL endpoint, I can come right over here, localhost 5000, and now I am hitting that same endpoint. So I can come into here and uh, put in, I wanna see posts, and I wanna see the ID, and I wanna see the title, and hit play, and there we go. I am consuming that RESTful API that's running on that other port. GraphQL is taking what I'm sending it here and then forwarding those calls on. So let me show you how this works. If I go over to source and go to index, this should look familiar to you because here I have set up GraphQL like I did in that previous demo. In fact, this code is I believe identical. If not, it is extremely similar. Uh, so the thing that's different though is my schema. Let's go look at the schema itself. And this is where things get interesting. Notice that in my resolver, when I request an author, or I guess I just requested a post, so let's look at the post. When I request a post, look at what my resolver does. It makes an API call. It calls my existing RESTful API. So this is my suggestion for the practical thing that you could do when you get back into the office, is you stand up a GraphQL server and you call your existing RESTful APIs. And now you get to be a hero because all of a sudden people can request pieces of your data set. People can request relationships in your data set. You now have documentation that is strongly typed, that is generated, that you can interact with right there in the browser. You get all of that through GraphQL. Now, I imagine you're wondering how the heck this works. One thing to show. So I come into here. Let me watch, let's just watch what happens here. When I make a network request, uh, I need to pull this up a bit so I can see it. So here's this network request. So what I just did, anytime that I make a query in GraphQL, I am making a post. So there's a decision made. How many of you remember being in an argument on your API whether you should use get, put, post, and delete? See, hands all over the place. I have two. GraphQL, you don't get in that argument. You use post for everything. It's a decision that's made. It's part of the specification. And some of you would go, wait, 
Why just post? Because it works, because it's fine. You are sending some data to the server. And what determines whether you're changing data or writing data is if it's a query, it contains the word query. Or if you omit the word query, then it assumes that it's a query. If you want to do a mutation, you put the word mutation in the query. So let, let's see what's actually getting sent over to the server here. So here is my request right down here. I've got my query and my variables. I'm not setting any variables here. Uh, I won't really get into variables just for sake of time, but you can parameterize your queries and then pass variables in those placeholders. Uh, but if I take this right here, notice that what this is right here, that is my query. I know that's kind of small. Let me see if I can size that up a bit. And actually, if I copy this and maybe paste it into, into a text editor, oh, well, that doesn't look great either. Uh, because it actually brings over those silly uh, Chrome's little things. So all those little arrows are returns. But nonetheless, what you can see is the string is the query. So when you are doing dev in GraphQL, here's the flow that tends to happen. You go over to the GraphQL server, or graph, to the graphical interface here. You write your query. And when you have seen that your query returns the data that you want, or that the mutation does what you want, you copy this, and then you paste it into your code as a string. Usually, perhaps in a separate file if you want. But now you're done. You know that it works. It's already tested. Complete. It gets sent over in your posts. And we can see an example of that as well. Uh, let's go one step farther. I'm going to hit Control C here. So I am a React developer, and I enjoy working with, uh, let's, let's do the React vanilla GraphQL GitHub. So now we're going to get a little more real again. Let me hit NPM Start. This is going to start up a React application. How many of you are working in React? Ooh, lots of hands. OK, quite a few. How, many, how about Angular? That's the other half of the room. We're done. OK, now Vue? Probably quite a few in Vue. OK. Uh, all right, so this is a simple GitHub issue search. Uh, and if I click Search, it's going to make a call to the GitHub API and then return back some information. Now, given this looks uh, ugly, but it's simple. It does the trick. Uh, and it is returning data using GraphQL. We can come in here and see if we go to the network tab. Let me refresh this again, and then hit search in here. Uh, oops. And then uh, I will pull this up again. We can see the query right here. Uh, and the data getting sent right there. There is my query for it. Oh, wait. No, that's not the one I want. Is this old? That's not the query I just ran, is it? No, it wouldn't be. Let me clear this, and then rerun it. This is the request. Yes, so right down here, see the, there's my query. Organization of Facebook, repository React, and here's the query itself that got sent. So it made a post, it sent some data on that. So let's go look at the code for this project. I'm going to close stuff out and show how this plays. So what I want to show is, React application, nothing really to see here. This is the entry point. Uh, and I want to emphasize, you don't have to know React to understand what I'm going to show here. What I want to show is, I made a query right here. What I did was I said, go to GitHub's API and then pass along the query. Uh, the query that I sent it is right here, get issues of repository. Now this query uh, doesn't quite fit on a screen because I'm zoomed in a lot. But if you look at it, I'm passing over some arguments here, because I'm saying I want a certain organization, I want a certain repository, and then this whole cursor thing is just there for pagination. But nonetheless, you can see that it is copied out of graphical, pasted into a string, and I'm done. And if you don't like this sitting in the app file, go ahead and put it in a separate JS file, because it's a string. Nothing special about it. So that's the way you end up holding your queries. Now, 
notice that when I make the call, I don't need any extra tools to make this happen. I'm using Axios to make a post here, but I could use plain fetch, I could use XML, HTTP request, uh, and that's that. Now, since I'm interacting with GitHub, I do need to send a, a bearer token just for authentication there. But I wanna emphasize here to you that this part looks no different than any other API call that you might make. But notice, it's pretty simple though because I'm always going to do a post. And I'm always going to hit api.github.com regardless of how I wanna interact with GitHub. This is another important lesson with GraphQL. In this world of microservices that we've had the last few years, people have been standing up service after service after service, and the problem starts to become discovery. You go, okay, what APIs are out there? So people have different ways of handling discovery. People will create a service reg registry. Sometimes that's as simple as a website that lists all the different microservices and has links to each of their swagger docs is a pretty popular way. Well, with GraphQL, discovery can go away because you can have one GraphQL endpoint for the company. And that sounds completely unscalable, but it scales and Facebook has proven that, by the way. The way that it scales is, remember how I showed you set up a schema uh, for your server. Well, that schema file, you can split that schema file into as many files as you want. So you could say, this team owns this schema file, this team owns this schema file, and then in the end, you glue them all together for the GraphQL server. So discovery is no longer a problem for GitHub, for instance, because GitHub knows all of our data is right here. One other thing to emphasize. Anybody heard of OData? Okay, quite a few hands. So OData, do you look at this and think, hmm, that's kinda like OData. And when I first saw this, that was my first reaction too. And I remember when OData came out, I was just gangbusters excited because I thought, this is the second coming. This is gonna be amazing and everybody's gonna do OData. Uh, so this isn't the first time I've gotten really excited about something in technology. This was the problem with OData. OData was open by default. When OData came out, it was effectively saying, here's my database, have at it. And if you didn't do some work, people were going to pummel you. It defaulted to open. And that was, in retrospect, a mistake. And largely, they've addressed that over time with new versions. GraphQL is precisely the opposite of that. Because with GraphQL, you start out completely closed. You do nothing until you decide to do something. And I wanna emphasize this, because when I created this schema over here for this, let's look at this schema for uh, this earlier demo. Notice, uh, oh no, I wanna look at this, this one instead. Okay, notice that I make the decision Right here, I decide what objects I want to expose. And I also decide in my resolver what happens. I decide what parameters, what arguments must be passed in to my queries and my mutations. So GitHub is a wonderful example of this because I was over here, I was showing you this GitHub query down here. Now notice, if I'm going to, ooh, that's not helpful. If I'm going to make a call to GitHub GitHub does not let me say, select star from repository. And you can imagine why. What GitHub says is, if you want to query us for our repositories, you need to give me an organization, you need to give me the repository. So I have to say, I want the Facebook organization, and I want the React repository. And you can think about the SQL that gets generated behind the scenes. That's a very efficient query because now it's select star or select specific fields from table. So as a GraphQL developer, it is right over here that you hold all the power in the world because you are deciding how open you want to be with your database. If you don't want people getting all the data or making expensive queries, then you design your resolver accordingly. You say, we're not going to let you do a select star on user. We're going to require that you give us a user ID. We'll give you user, users by ID, but not the whole thing. So this gives you a real clear hand in the performance implications of your deployment for GraphQL. 
we've looked at a lot of code. So before I shift over to some slides, uh, I'm guessing some people have some questions. Hit me. Anybody? Okay, so y your question is, can you show me an example of what a mutation would look like? Yes. I don't have an example of a mutation ready, but the way it would look would be the same as uh, what I'm showing you right here, except the word query would be replaced with the word mutation, and then. Oh. Well, you're pointing out that this one is doing a GET request. So yes, if I was hitting a RESTful API that expected me to do a send an HTTP delete on a deletion, for instance, then I would have to make that HTTP call here that way. I would have to pass a delete verb and those sorts of things. So what I want to clarify is resolvers are a function that gets data. That's it. So that function may reference hard-coded data like I showed earlier. It may make an API call or it may query a database directly because you don't need to call some other API with GraphQL. You can hit the database directly. In fact, if any of you in here are using PostgreSQL, uh, there are two different services that will generate a GraphQL database, or I'm sorry, a GraphQL API directly off your PostgreSQL. Postgres database, which is really uh, quite impressive. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Let's say, let's say it is like, I want to both be able to read from a REST API and point Postgres back to it. Does it have to be like, if then logically has to write their code to resolve? Oh, okay. So your your question is, you okay? So your question largely is, how do I differentiate between a mutation and a query right here in my resolver? Uh, you would you would end up yeah looking at the is this a mutation or is this a query and then writing your, your resolver accordingly, right there. Yeah, because you're you're right. When I'm talking about I'm making a call to post here. Yeah. So this is a simpler example. Um, yeah. It's, so you had a hand back over here. I do not in here, no. What, what would it look like? Is this, so it would be a node, and the node has a way to directly talk to the database and have that? Or is it specific to GraphQL? It's got its own syntax for the database. So interacting with different databases is going to look different. And like that was one thing I wanted to show is, like if you chose to use, uh, Hashura has an interesting tool, uh, GraphQL Engine, that lets you stand up GraphQL APIs right on top of Postgres. So that even eliminates some of the boilerplate that I'm talking about here uh, of effectively what it does is looks at your schema and then is able to generate a, uh, it looks at, I should be more specific, it looks at your Postgres database schema and then generates a GraphQL schema from it, uh, reading those types. So that can, uh, that precise answer is going to be different. And you point out, I should have, put an example in here of hitting a real DB, but I don't. I'm showing wrapping uh, REST API. And honestly, in my experience, uh, most people are wrapping their APIs using GraphQL today. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons is you could think about GraphQL as the back end for the front end, potentially. Now, I think longer term, we're going to see people increasingly just standing up GraphQL and, and right in front of their, their DBs. Uh, but today, what tends to happen is people have invested a whole lot of money in their existing services, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with them. It would just be nice if we stopped getting into arguments about Git versus post, and how to do pagination, and how to do filtering, and how to do sorting. I mean, all of those things become painful conversations, and if I surveyed the room, you'd find different people with, with different uh, preferences there. Uh, so it's, th that's one of the big pieces of value is having the spec. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I'm in post, I'm going to validate after. 
Yes. So his question is, what about caching? Uh, so caching is an area that is trickier, admittedly, with GraphQL because you are making posts. And also, think about this. I could end up caching this query, but if someone else makes this query, that's not a cache hit because it's a different query. It returned different data. So your numbers of cache hits are likely to go down to a degree, although if you think about this, your application is, a given application is going to request a certain shape pretty consistently. So you're going to get cache hits from a given app quite often. But if you have a lot of different apps that are hitting the same data sources in different ways, they're not going to get cache hits. So that becomes a problem uh, that way. So that, that is definitely one of the, the downsides. But that said, it is um, certainly solvable. Yeah. So that's a good question. So when you write a, oh, failed to fetch. Oh, wait, am I hitting one that I'm not running anymore? That's probably why. Uh, so your question is, what happens when I'm chaining, when I've got this nested data in here? Well, if you have, imagine in this case, you've got a posts endpoint, and you've got an author endpoint. So yeah, you're going to have an n plus 1 problem here. Because behind the scenes, yeah, you're going to get the posts, and you get 10 posts back. And then you're going to make a call to author 10 times to get the author data. And that's systemic to, if that's the APIs that you have to work with at the moment, that's reality for you. And in fact, today, if those are your APIs, that's what your application has to do. That's precisely why people go out and they say, well, let's add some other APIs on top of this, and let's limit the chattiness. So GraphQL can't magically fix that if you are wrapping your existing APIs. The decision for that comes down to then, maybe we should enhance our APIs that we're calling, or maybe we should call the database directly. Uh, so you have control there. Yeah? So the question was, what about authorization? Well, keep in mind, your resolver is a function that retrieves data. So your resolver, you have all the power to choose what to do there. Uh, and in that way, yes, you're also on the hook to say, OK, can the person who has just requested this do what has been asked? Unfortunately, I don't have a, a good example of the, the authorization side of it. But if you think about the resolvers as functions that get the data, it's also that resolver's responsibility to, to vet whoever's making that request. Well, uh, at least, uh, yeah, if a bearer token is involved, that would logically be what you'd be checking, although that's one way to have the, the auth -Z story. Yeah. Lots of good questions. All right. Oh, yes. I don't remember offhand. And I can't, I can't ever remember requesting a blob type from GraphQL. If I remember right, it's kind of weird. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, I, th I think what people would normally do is request the string instead, the, the file path, and then request it that way. And, and largely, that's what I would end up doing with RESTful APIs as well. Uh, give me the data that shows me how to get to it, and then I'll make the request separately. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good question. I'm trying to take notes. I will add that to the next talk. So, okay, so let's let's talk slides for a second because I just showed you a lot of stuff. Let's talk about the pain that you might be feeling today. Transformations, as in when I request data, is it in the shape that I want? Often it's not, so you end up having to change that data. Who ends up doing transformations on the client? Lots of people. Overfetching, as in I wanted the banana, but you gave me the whole jungle. You know, uh, that's that's a problem. That's, this happens a lot too. Or underfetching, where I request the user and I need 
all these properties, but the API only gives me half of them right now. So somebody's got to go crack open the code and do a deployment to give me these other properties that I wanted. Long chains of API calls, and this gets to what the gentleman in the back was, was pointing out, where you're going, oh man, so I've got to make a call to post, and then I've got the author data, and now I've got to go get all the author data, and then I've got to get all the comments data based on each one of those posts. So chains go away, uh, GraphQL. Waiting for API changes, this is another thing that I like. Uh, I tend to code against mock APIs a lot because I don't want to wait for an API team to create those changes. Uh, with GraphQL, as long as the data's there, I can get it in the shape that I want. How much time have we spent as developers arguing over API design? Git versus put versus post versus delete, filtering, sorting, deletions, pag pagination. Uh, how should we document our app, our API? All of these things go away because the GraphQL spec says, here's how you do it. So choosing GraphQL makes 100 decisions for you. When you're going to call your API, think about how you have to go over then into JavaScript and you have to use Axios or use whatever it may be to call your API. With GraphQL, that pain is you need a, something that makes a post and it takes the query that you've already written over in graphical, so that pain goes away. How many of you know when somebody's calling a specific query and what properties they're using on those queries? I'm doubting anyone does, but that's a reality that uh, can happen, GraphQL. And of course, documentation is important. Solve the problem. Graphical is the canonical standard. There are others out there like Playground, which are extremely similar to graphical, but the docs are solved. And discovery. If you have one endpoint that has all your data exposed, Discovery is no longer an issue. Go out to the GraphQL endpoint and use it. So contrast that with GraphQL. You don't have to do transformations. There's no problems with overfetching or underfetching because you're asking for precisely what you want. You're not waiting for API mods because you ask what you, for what you want. You don't have to chain API calls because you make one call to get the data in the desired shape. No more debates on API design, no API proxy boilerplate. Your docs, you set a Boolean to say, yes, I would like docs, and you probably want docs. Uh, discovery, not a problem. To me, this is something we should celebrate. I mean, this is good stuff. Wait for it, there we go. That escalated quickly. Yeah, that, this kid, yeah. I don't know if his dad showed him that, but <laughs> it's worth seeing twice, yeah. So, I will say as a side note, uh, this slide deck, uh, if you want to dive more into GraphQL, this slide deck is really intended for a full day on-site training session, but I'm just using pieces of it in here, and I focused more on our uh, demos along the way. But So you can go out to the repo and see more about uh, some of these things that I'm going to blow past here. This, this is what is so important, though. This is what sets GraphQL apart from... REST in general. Uh, REST is not a specification. Uh, GraphQL is a specification. What REST is, is an architectural pattern. It's an architectural, it's a way to structure APIs, but it is not specific. See, REST came from Roy Fielding writing a dissertation years ago, and a dissertation is not a specification. Those are very different things. And that's precisely why we've gotten into long arguments about Git and post and what hypermedia means and how you're supposed to handle hypermedia, what these anchors should look like, what these links between different resources should be, because we don't have the Bible for rest. We don't have a spec for that. Now, given, I will say, there are some good specifications out there. If you want to stay in the realm of rest, I would encourage you to look at JSON API. Anybody using JSON API? I figured not because no one out here said that they were able to request certain properties. JSON API specifies that. It's called sparse field sets. And with JSON API, you can sit in the query string and say, here are the particular properties that I want for the user or for the vehicle, whatever entity I'm requesting. So what GraphQL is, what I've shown you here, it's a query language. And it has a type system. 
And it works with any language. There are libraries for C Sharp and for Java and Python and Ruby. And I've, I've shown you Node. Node is the canonical implementation uh, and also used by Facebook. So it's the most mature. But good examples for just about any tech out there. One HTTP endpoint, which is nice because it means on the client you write very little boilerplate code. You need to make an HTTP call. Now there's some other good tools out there like Apollo. I'm not going to spend time going into Apollo, but it makes things even easier. You can be very declarative about getting data from GraphQL. But it's not tied to any database technology. It's a specification uh, and a type system. So on the server, what I showed was we described the data structure, and on the client, you request the exact data that you want. Now, I want to clarify, you look at this chart. This is a chart for GraphQL po popularity. And that looks pretty promising. GraphQL has been growing quite quickly. But if I put REST on there, this gives you a sense of where we are. GraphQL is coming. And GraphQL is growing at a rate where it's going to be quite a while before it potentially becomes more popular than the REST style that so many people are using. But I want to emphasize, like this room, I asked in here, how many are using React? Lots of people using React. Well, if you rewind, look at this chart. For the longest time, Angular was king. But React slowly grew, 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 and eventually it dethroned Angular as number one on Google Trends for what that's worth. So I think we are somewhere about halfway along here. But I do believe that we are headed toward a world where GraphQL becomes the majority because of all the reasons that I've talked about here. And in fact, I, what I pay attention to are when people I look up to start diving into GraphQL and singing its praises, I pay attention. So John Rezig created jQuery. Uh, and he wrote a book recently on GraphQL. And he feels like it's the successor to REST APIs. Um, his subtitle is actually, It's the New REST. So there's, that said though, I, I know I have a link bait title on this talk, but I really, I'm not suggesting that you throw away your RESTful APIs. I think you keep them running, but you end up potentially using GraphQL as the back end for your front end, because now you can build UIs so much faster. Okay. So I am going to jump past, I'm on slide 20. I got 167 slides. We're on 20. Yeah, we're not going to do all these. So, and the reason I have all these slides is I spend a lot of time conveying the, oh man, I'm really sad that we didn't get to this one. But uh, th this is a reference to REST though. Have you ever heard this though when people, you get in an argument about REST and people say, what, you can do that with REST. What you're showing right there isn't a RESTful API. It's the no true Scotsman problem, that every time you say something negative about something, people go, well, that's not actually an example of that thing. If it was a real example, it wouldn't have that downside. Uh, so getting in arguments about REST tends to feel very religious because people are, they don't have uh, any specification to reference. It's a lot of different opinions on these areas. So with, with GraphQL, I know all of these things. I know about versioning and which HTTP verbs. I know about filters, pagination. All these other questions are solved. I mean, this, is, this has often been reality for me, is this feeling of I get in an argument uh, about REST, and it's, OK, what really is it? It's, it feels like a moving goalpost conversation. Uh, and in fact, so I put out a survey uh, at a previous conference just to see how many people were doing some of these different things. Uh, and very few people are doing hypermedia with REST. And in fact, quite a few people, how many of you know what hypermedia is? The, the minority, even though the majority of this room says they're doing REST, a lot of people would say true REST is doing hypermedia, which means when I make a call to a user, there should be a link on there that allows me to go grab all of their addresses and should tell me the the link should tell me how to get there. That, that was the big idea that Roy Fielding declared, but very few people have done that. So that's made the REST terminology tricky. And if you go look at when people build RESTful APIs, all these different features in here, like filtering, sorting, pagination, caching, this was from my survey. Less than half of people do all these things because, again, it's not in the spec. I've got, if somebody's got to really tell me to do it, for me to do it. 
Whereas with GraphQL, a bunch of these things just happen for free. Consistent error messaging, interactive docs, being able to customize the JSON shape, being able to get sparse field sets where I get just part of that data. And then all of these over here in the green, they're standardized, but they're optional. So it's like going from special snowflakes, all of us are RESTful APIs today look different. And that way, the big downside of that right now is we don't have an ecosystem of tools to make them better over time. Whereas with GraphQL specification, we've seen all sorts of really interesting tools come out because the specification, the strongly typed nature of the schema gives you bedrock to stand on. OK, so let me scroll to the end. And Let's go right here. So my suggestion is this. Use both. Wrap your REST APIs uh, for optional use. And people can continue to call the REST APIs directly, but what you'll probably find is once people see how nice it is to call the GraphQL endpoints and the power that that gives them, then you get it. So the, the good thing is you can stand up that GraphQL API and make it optional for people. See if they will show up and they will uh, enjoy what's there. Because all of this gets solved. That's a lot of good stuff. So if you want to dive farther into this, this is the URL for the repo. This has all of the demos that I showed you today. Uh, also, I offer consulting services uh, for React and GraphQL. Uh, and you can find out more about me at reactjsconsulting.com. I'm also house core on Twitter. There's tons of links in here to different blog posts and demos that I found useful. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you on Twitter as well. That is my talk. I got five minutes left, but uh, I'm going to give you that time back. I'm going to sit down up here if anybody wants to talk shop and ask more questions. Thanks for listening. Enjoy in DC. See ya.